Hey, Chris, how you doing today, bud? I am great, man. Thanks for having me on. Dude, this book is so important to this generation because what you're doing is is that it, even though it's in words, you are teaching modern day eyes to understand what making a movie is all about. It's not about TikTok and YouTube. Sure, they're doing great, but you're giving us history here that can change those that are on TikTok. Well, it's history, but it's also, you know, I, I thank you for that, but it's also, um, I think it's, it's interesting to note that the mediums may have changed. Uh, but the, the, the method is still the same. Yes. And if you can apply, you know, I have a, I have three sons. My 16 year old son is, a, is also a Corman fan and he's reading, currently reading the autobiography cause he's getting involved in film and the idea, the hustle, the story about how to circumnavigate limitations. I mean, it's all there nothing has changed in that respect. So yeah, it's important to kind of go back in time, get a history lesson, but also see these, this inspirational way Corman became what he became. Um, which can be, again, transposed to this generation. Well, I love the continuation of the entire journey here because, you know, it starts off with Poe, then Corman, and now you're writing about the book. I mean, it's like the, the raindrop goes down and feeds the seed. The seed becomes the tree. The tree now writes, you know, gives us paper to write on. Yeah, and it also, it's it's funny, the whole, um, you know, circular way that pop culture evolves and retreats and, and cannibalizes itself too in that, you know, so many authors and filmmakers who are making Poe-esque works themselves, you know, some of them may may not have even read Poe, but they've seen these films Mm -hmm. or seen films that were inspired by these films. Mm -hmm. So that kind of bloodline comes back to the page anyways in, in strange ways. Everything is connected and, um, yeah, absolutely. Man, what's really great about this is that it takes it, the time period is 1960 to 1964. That's pre Beatles, and and I love that time period because everything in this co- this country and around the world was so unique and different. You know, it's funny. You, there's a couple of reasons why that's interesting. What you just said, it's pre Beatles, and as we know, or maybe some of your listeners don't, but that was obviously you know the pop culture guard changes every so often, and that was a big changing of the guard when the Beatles, especially when they came to America, um, but. 1964, The Mask of the Red Death, Roger's uh, penultimate, his second last Poe film, starred Jane Asher, who at that time was dating a young Paul McCartney. (laughs) And uh, Roger, they kind of had an open relationship, and it's fair to say that Roger was also kind of dating Jane Asher at the time. (laughs) And uh, uh, Jane said, look, Roger, tomorrow we're going to be joined at at lunch. He's coming by the set uh, with my my boyfriend. His name's Paul McCartney. He's, He's in this little band called The Beatles. And uh, so Roger had lunch with him. He was a very nice, Roger took him as a very nice young man and they all got along together and uh, everything was great. And a couple of days later, Roger picks up the newspaper and it says Beatles conquer America. <laughs> so it was literally on the cusp. These movies were made on the cusp of that changing of the guard. And then after Roger finished in 65 making the tomb of Lygia, he could sense that the guard had changed and that the counterculture was now usurping the culture. And he gave up making gothic horror films. That was his last one. And he went on to make um, more immediate youth-oriented films that kind of reflected the rock and roll culture of the time. Yeah. What's really interesting about, about the book is the fact that you include the interviews. I Maybe it's the radio guy in me, but I love interviews. And I love the way that you bring them in as part of the story and not like a, a soundbite that I would get on the 5 o'clock news. Now, the interviews are important because to listen to Roger speak is to listen to a kind of poetry. Yeah. He's uh, he's he's got this soothing, almost, uh, you know, calm, new age voice. He's, a, you know, a very literate, intelligent man, first and foremost. It's funny that he makes all these wacky movies, but he's an intellectual and he speaks like a college professor, you know. So it's a joy just to listen to him speak, whether that be in the flesh or in, you know, transcribed into the written word. You can hear if you close your eyes, you can hear him speak. It was important for me to have the interviews be the kind of spine of the of the book because this book really is nothing else more if, if not than a love letter to a 20 year friendship with that i have with roger and conversations i've had for many many years about the making of these movies and if you're going to learn about these pictures the yeah. best way to learn about them is from the man who made them who was there the architect of the pictures themselves and roger being 97 still with us still hale and hearty i wanted to get this book out so he could see it and hold it. Now, he did write the foreword, as you mentioned, but I'm seeing him, um, you know, this weekend we have a launch in LA and he'll be with me for that. So it's a real joy to be able to sit down with him and have him hold this book Mm. and and have that. I I hope to God that you're going to, you're keeping a journal about stuff like this because this is once in a lifetime moments, dude. 
Well, I keep journals in the sense that, uh, you know, I never, like an elephant, never forget. But, you know, this interview, for instance, is part, is a, part of the journal. Like, it's a document that, that this has happened. So, you know, I do appreciate you giving me the space here today to... Uh, to muse on this book and, and, and the kind words you're saying about it. It's, it means a lot. Well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a document whore, basically. And I, I love anything <laughs> that has to do with what's taken place because what, what, what I find from it is that it what in, was inspired afterwards, what came afterwards, or what, what led to even uh, Corman being who he was. And, and that's the thing about it. it. He didn't just suddenly appear. There were things that had to happen before he could become himself. Yeah, there was a, and it was in an easy road. It was a, the road less traveled. Yeah. And Roger uh, is now and was then defiant and resilient. He also had a keen eye to scope out talent and young talent specifically. And part of that was because yes, young talent works for for cheap. I mean, Roger has been a very always been you know unabashedly a very frugal producer, and that's why he could be so prolific. But remember, if it wasn't for Roger Corman, we would not have the new wave of American yes. cinema that hit screens in the 1960s. We wouldn't have Jack Nicholson. You know, Jack Nicholson's first few roles were with Roger. We wouldn't have Peter Fonda. We wouldn't have, um, you know, Dennis Hopper to some degree, Bruce Dern, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola was Roger's personal assistant and directed some of the scenes in The Haunted Palace. Um, so he kind of created an environment for these young talents to explore and become what they became and to learn from Roger as well. So Roger's not only a great filmmaker, an inventor, but he's also, uh, you know, the father, the founding father of the American independent film. See, that's what fascinates me. I call that the family tree. It's the same thing with music. Music has its family tree. I mean, I, I how, how the heck did we know that Michael McDonald was once a, not only just a Doobie brother, but he was also in Steely Dan. Knowing that history helps you understand why people love the music today. Well, absolutely. And I think of what's important and why this, this I wrote this book and why people keep coming back to these movies it's important that people are reminded about this that this doesn't just you know we we study history not just as a lesson to not repeat it but sometimes we want to repeat it yeah we want to keep it alive we want to make sure that the lessons and the the people that forged that path aren't forgotten and nor are their methods because we can learn so much from what they did and how they did it these are timeless lessons when it comes to horror films then versus today, today seems to be about more than shock and awe. They, they, they want you, they're, they're trying to do something to you, but it's not like the films of, of, of Corman. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because we can't give Roger a free pass and say he made uh, masterpieces every time right. or that he makes socially responsible movies every time. Some of his movies are gutter trash. And as he went on to own his own studio, New World Pictures, in, this, in the 70s, he certainly uh, stabbed at the, uh, you know, hope to, to you know hit the tail on the donkey trying to hit the target every time and sometimes he didn't care where he hit yeah. um so not all of them are great uh but as far as comparing then to now i mean we kind of have a golden age in some respects when it comes to the genre because we have so many platforms and there's so much need for content so there's so many diverse filmmakers making movies that if we really care to look we'll find some crazy stuff we also have a global village so movies that we you know previously never got a chance to be exposed to from all over the planet we now can find at the push of a button. Yeah. So that's great. But when it comes to mainstream Hollywood American stuff, the big problem I have with contemporary horror films is that most of them are made by people who grew up watching horror films. And I say that because the great horror films of all time, whether it be The Exorcist or the Corman Poe films or Halloween, they were made by uh, filmmakers who loved film full stop oh. who had many different appendages in their lives who had many different experiences and brought all those to the screen using the genre as the entry point that's why those movies have more uh, that endure they endure and they have more soul today I, I feel like we're kind of just repeating beats in many respects mm -hmm. which is nothing wrong with that you know friday night date movie and somebody's jump, something jumps and the your girlfriend screams and you get to cuddle up a little closer. That's kind of the, the, the soul of the horror movie as well. But for sure, to make a great horror movie does not mean you have to be necessarily even a fan of horror movies, yeah. I don't think. You just have to understand film. Can you imagine if Roger got his hands on a 10-episode series on Netflix or Hulu? I mean, because that, look at all that room to share a story. Yeah, and I don't know why he's he hasn't um, hasn't done that. That's that's an interesting interesting thing that uh, never never came to be. Maybe he's it's too late in the day now for mm -hmm. that. I'm not sure, uh, but it could come down to the bottom line with Roger. You never know. 
Yeah. Does it make financial sense for Roger to do that versus to jam out another Sharktopus movie really quick and take the money and run? I mean, again, and we I don't say this in a derogatory way. Roger <laughs> makes movies to make money. You know, I mean, that's true. I, but uh, but so, I love that attitude. That That's the movie business. That's what I love about that. Yes. Yeah, it's the film business, kids. That, we have to remember that word. <laughs> it is first and foremost a business. One of the funniest Corman stories, I, you know, when you talk to enough of his collaborators and you know them, is I think it was Slumber Ma Party Massacre 2 he kind of uh, gave the green light to because uh, he wanted to, um, you know, put new blinds up in his in his den, his living room or something like that. And he wanted to fund that. So he kind of put that deal together so he'd get that cut so that he could do a little bit of home decorating. I mean, And that's probably true. I mean, <laughs> you know, then there's nothing wrong with that, man. Nothing. He, he has nothing more to prove. Let's put it that way. I'd like to be a fly on the wall in some of those early day meetings because he was all about business and he gets with an actor. You know, actors are artists. They artists come with with different things that get in the way. I, he, Roger just seems to be the type of guy who would have said it's about cash flow. Don't be a rock in my stream. Well, it's about cash flow, but it's also about having a bit of artistic integrity, too. And because he was American International Pictures house director and they gave him carte blanche. He was able to bring in some things, some subtext and some things that he was interested in talking about and discussing, but he would hide them in the back end, right? <laughs> so you could watch his movies and not pick up on any of it, or you could watch them a little closer and see it. Now, when he did try to create something that was a little bit more, um, you know, progressive, um, he lost money. So that's why you didn't see a lot of that. There was 1961, he made a movie called The Intruder with William Shatner, Ooh. based on a book uh, by, um, uh, say by Charles Beaumont. And it was about a white supremacist who rolls into a Southern town and tries to uh, frame a black man and get him lynched mm. in the public square. And uh, a really volatile, nasty piece of work. Uh, to this day, probably the movie that Roger thinks is his best film. And it was the only film in his arc, his hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures deep arc that lost money. So he found that if you were going to discuss you know, these sorts of socially volatile topics, it was best to hide them and cloak them in the guise of fantasy in the back end as opposed to make them the, the, the calling card. You see what you're doing with this book and with this conversation? Listeners are going to go, oh my God, I've got to go find this movie. Th that's what I love about today where it's not about just reading it in a magazine. It, you're, you're sharing the journey through words as well as things on a page. Well, thank you. And I 100% agree with that. It's also about having a vested interest in this stuff. And it's exciting for me to be able to, you know, again, as a father, as a teacher, you know, all these things, but as a lover of film, to be able to open doors and to be able to point arrows to things that I think are really interesting and then feel that joy when somebody decides to go through that door and feels the same way about it. There's no better feeling in the world, no more gratification than I get anywhere, anytime than uh, turning people on to things I like. And you know, primarily what I love is weird movies. So uh, it's really cool. <laughs> the photographs in the book. Oh, my God. You had to. What What was the discipline? Because I would have put everything in, in there. Any any photo you had, I would have put it in. But you had to use a discipline to pick out the right photographs. Well, first of all, you're looking for unique behind the scenes photos, too, that show Roger doing what he does. So I was able to with uh, various collectors to get some photos that, <clears throat> to my knowledge, haven't been published in print anywhere. Uh, you know, a handful of those, which just show Roger doing what he does on set to prove that he was there yeah. to get photographic evidence of the director of photography, Floyd Crosby, doing what lighting a scene. So that was cool. But what's also really cool about these movies and the movies of that period is the flamboyant marketing uh, campaigns that went along with them. <laughs> So not only finding the official American posters, which are tried and true and trotted out all the time, but to really sift through the vaults and find some of these wild European posters, which are sometimes just so outrageous, um, <laughs> and to really get them in there as well, to not only just dazzle the eyeballs, but to exemplify the reach of these pictures. They weren't, didn't just open and close in New York or LA and the big cities, they, they spread their tendrils across the planet. And, uh, and sometimes the Europeans being less restrained than uh, the Italian than the Americans would just go bananas with some of this art and some of it wasn't even accurate yeah. some of the art has no connection to the movie itself and that's what makes it so amusing so it was um, you know I would say it wasn't a painstaking uh, you know there was no process in my mind necessarily what it had to come and go I think mostly I just wanted to 
put stuff in there that a illustrated the words uh you brought the words to life but also just uh dazzled the eyeballs you know and i had a lot of material to play with when you have a book like this relinquishing it to us the readers is a great moment but doesn't that also create a sense of mourning inside your heart because i mean i know you're going to jump into something new but you have a lot of love in these pages yeah i mean that's but that's life isn't it yeah. everything that you build towards whether it be um a monumental birthday celebration, anything that you take some time and effort and energy and blood, sweat and tears to build. Once it's done, is it, isn't it like what's that, uh, the allegory about the the search for El Dorado, the city of gold? It's, it's not about, you know, you may never find that city. Maybe it doesn't even exist, but it's the quest. Once the quest is over, there's always a sense of melancholy. But you're right. I mean, that's probably why um, I'm so prolific and have my fingers in so many pies <laughs> is that I don't really have the chance to dwell too hard on on that on that sense of loss. Uh, and not only that, I mean, I, the books are different. I mean, this will travel. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I suspect this will be bumping around for the rest of my life in, in some way, shape or form. God. So it's 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 only it's the end of one chapter of its journey and it's the beginning of the other one. You give it away to the world and it becomes its own thing, right? Oh, I love your creative attitude. You got to come back to this show anytime in the future, Chris. The door is always going to be open for you. Well, just uh, just let me know and I'm I'm there, man. Excellent. Thanks for the thanks for doing this. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? You too, man.